what is facilitative leadership? I really didn't know much about this concept. You know, I could kind of give you a guess of what I think it would be, but Tammy Hobson, I had her on the podcast today and she talked about this. And one of the things I really appreciated about it was her focus on actually co-creating visions together and not just talking about what this could like look like in, you know, kind of a theoretical uh, position, but actually what does this actually look like in the classroom? When people say they have a focus on making something happen or a huge vision, one of the things that I think is a really important question to ask, if you were to achieve that vision, what would that look like in a classroom? How would that impact kids? Like, give me tangibles of what this looks like because then it brings that vision to a reality. And so that's a really important process of this facilitative leadership because people are way more likely to achieve a vision if they actually know what it will look like in the, in the schools and in classrooms, but they also had a part in creating that. And I think that was such a uh, really important concept that Tammy talked about in this concept about facilitative leadership. I really love getting to know Tammy. I know you're going to love connecting with her too. Welcome back to another episode of the Innovators Mindset Podcast. Hey everyone, this is George Kroos. Welcome back to another episode of the Innovators Mindset Podcast. I'm so blessed to have Tammy Hobson on. She is actually located in Virginia. We connected via LinkedIn. I started learning more about her. She's learning about, she actually knows my podcast better than I do. I'm like, did I say that? So she was listening to it, kind of put me on the spot. I'm like, yeah, it's not AI. It's actually me, but I can't remember what I said literally 30 minutes ago, let alone, you know, a month ago. So uh, Tammy has actually worked at all levels of education. Um, she's currently a consultant. She works with groups all over the world. So she has a very unique perspective. Uh, we were talking before, and I'm going to ask her about this, about the idea of facilitative leadership. But before we get into that, if you can just tell everyone who you are, what you do today and how you got there, I think it's a great place to start. Sure. Um, I always answer that question with mom. I'm a mom and a wife and a daughter and a friend. Um, I also happen to be um, an entrepreneur, um, an educator, a hyper learner um, and I got that way by way of teaching, um, fifth grade teacher to begin with, uh, middle school math, uh, expeditionary learning coach or an instructional coach, administrator. So I was in elementary school, then middle school for a number of years, all the way up to the assistant principalship um, and had a little one and wanted to get back to elementary school because I wanted to make sure I could bring that little one anywhere and everywhere in an elementary school. That is one of the ways to build relationships mm -hmm. authentically. Um, and so it allowed me to be that that mom that I wanted to be as well. And uh, was an assistant principal, was a principal, and then ended up in central office leadership by way of strategic planning, leadership, innovation coordinator, and then director of curriculum instruction. And then I've been a consultant now. Um, I call myself facilitator, leadership coach, and consultant. And this has been three and a half years in this role. So I'm going to now, because because you brought it up. So I'm going to ask you about this, and you know, because we can, I've, I've asked people before about, you know, what's it like being a parent to your kid in mm -hmm. school, you brought up being a mom. And mm -hmm. you brought up being an entrepreneur. How do you kind of, cause there's like, there's some scheduling stuff, right? Like there's, there's an erratic mm -hmm. schedule. You're kind of all over the place. I know that you probably travel with some of your work. Is that fair to say? Mm -hmm, but a small percentage. I do a, a number of, um, I have a number of virtual opportunities stuff. online. Mm -hmm. yeah, so how virtual. do you find that? How do you find that? How does that just tell me about that experience, you know, being a mom and an entrepreneur and like kind of the intersection of those two things. The flexible schedule allows me to access my kiddo's life much differently than when I didn't have it. So that's a huge bonus. Um, you know, I'm home most of the time when she's getting ho home and she's 13. And so those those conversations that can happen within the first five or 10 minutes of her walking in the door are priceless. Um, but then I get that saturated time. But then the time away, honestly, um, when I was growing up, I'm an, I was an only child. My kiddo is an only child. That one-on-one that -on -one time I used to have with my mom or my dad is invaluable. So I know then she gets that with my husband and they just have their special times together. So it's it's a nice trade-off. Um, my husband's super supportive of when I'm at home, when I'm away from home. Um, and I just, I grew up in family businesses. So it um, I kind of understand it. It actually is, part, I would say, definitely part of my schema. It makes sense. Um, so I think I heard a long time ago, or maybe I read it, I don't remember, uh, but the quality of the time rather than the quantity of the time. However, in this role, I actually do get more time than I had before. Oh, you're going to have a bunch of people quitting their teaching jobs real quick. <laughs> oh, <laughs> sorry. No, that's okay. That's okay. Look, listen, I, I'm all about if you, if you love teaching, teach. If you hate teaching, don't mm -hmm. stay teaching. 
you know, find different, but you might like education. There's so many different opportunities in our world today. And like, I can't advocate for kids to find those opportunities while saying like, yeah, but you should stay miserable. So like, Hey, whatever works for you, that's what you got to figure out. So one of the things that, um, we talked about before we got on this and I wanted to kind of hear your definition, what that means to you. Um, you brought up that you're really passionate about facilitative leadership. So mm -hmm. I have in my mind what that is, but like, you know, people in education, we're notorious for saying words. Yes. And if I say, what does that actually mean? They're like, uh, I'm like, you say it all the time. Right. It's like the, mm -hmm. I don't know if you ever saw the princess bride. Like, I don't think you, that means what you think it means. <laughs> Right. Yeah. So like, what is facilitative leadership? Why are you so passionate about that process? Facilitative leadership, um, that's fair about the definition. Honestly, I feel like there's 101 ways to say it. But for me, it's the when you're truly leveraging the team and you're doing it authentically, like, you know, as a leader, you are there's no way to move forward without the the varied perspectives, without their ideas, without their inputs, without their solutions. Um, so as much as working toward something in the content and whatever it may be, the process is just as important for you um, and, and developing that team to, to lead themselves, to lead each other, et cetera. So you're facilitating the, you're creating the conditions um, where you're doing a lot of pulling out thinking, but the first and foremost is that common vision. And it's not your vision. It's right. a co-created vision um, and then creating the, the conditions to work toward that vision, knowing that those varied perspectives are of high value, uh, invaluable actually. So for me, it's just, I, I don't know how I would have done any of my jobs um, in the roles I was in to include the classroom mm -hmm. without the input of my students. I would have a reflection bin on my desk, which was how can we make this, you know, this is our classroom, not my classroom. What can we do differently? And kids would put, I mean, this was back with paper notes, you know, <laughs> and right. they would put in and I would read them at the end of the day and make changes for the next day based on the feedback. Um, so yeah. I would say that you now you think of a facilitator of a classroom, that might be a another way for people to make sense of it. Definitely the listeners to this podcast. You know, yeah, okay, I've shared this idea before. People get mad at me for sharing this, which I find is fascinating because you said this is our classroom, right? So one of the things mm -hmm. I actually suggest to teachers that I like, hey, a lot of them right now, we're recording this in July. They might be listening to this August. Right. Probably, they might even listen to this while they're decorating their classroom, right? And they're like spending hours upon hours getting that classroom like perfect mm -hmm. ready, you know, for the kids coming in. And then they'll say, it's our classroom. It's our, I'm like, well, that's kind of yours. Cause like, I didn't have any say in these decorations. Yeah. Right? So I actually encourage people to say like, Hey, actually don't decorate your classroom before the kids get there. And then on the first couple of days, decorate it together. Mm -hmm. Then you can actually, it's not gonna look as good. Like I promise you if little Georgie was in your class, partly decorating, cause he didn't become much better as a teacher to decorate the classroom, <laughs> not gonna look as good as what you're doing. But there is some ownership and there's some authenticity and it's a great mm -hmm. way to learn about your students. But then also there is a pride in, yeah, that's mine. That's that I put that up. That's like my thing up there too. And now there's mm -hmm. a little bit more ownership of the classroom. So is this a terrible mm -hmm. idea or like, is this actually tie into that idea of what you're sharing? Or is that like, because it does. I, sometimes I, people are like, no, I like decorating. I'm like, well, don't complain. You don't have any time because you spent two weeks doing it. Right. So get the kids. Yeah. To play, right. I would split the difference. I would say it needs to be warm and inviting. You know, it, it has to have some kind of um, curation of some kind where some right. things are, are ready. Um, but, so it's not invites like a, them not to like decorate. Paint guns. It's not like paint guns all over. Yeah, like ooh, maybe there's like, <laughs> like paper, like blank paper right. and a board, right. but it's not just a straight up cork board or whatever it may be nowadays. Um, right. But then allowing the kids and, you know, even maybe sharing your thinking, here's what I was originally thinking, because this is what I'm hoping oh, our class, what we might achieve together. Um, how can you help, you know, change my thinking? What are you thinking? And let them help on the, in the um, design process. Right. Um, and then the creation process. Yeah. I, I like that idea a lot. I, I, and I actually appreciate that you kind of tweaked it a little bit. You changed it. Cause I'm like, mm -hmm. yeah, that's actually probably a better way. Cause I, cause I honestly, maybe it's a little bit, I hated doing that so much. I'm like, I just, someone else do this for me. Right. Like, and then it's like, yeah, it's a great way to empower kids, but also I don't want to do it. <laughs> It's a at least like remove the desks from the corner where you had to get them off the wax. You yeah. know, you have to like cut under the desk. <laughs> okay. So I don't know. This is going to sound horrible. Like I told you this ahead of time. Like I got a haircut today and like my hair is like, Oh yeah. So I, we only got, I got one time, <laughs> time yeah. for one. And I don't want to pretend that I'm like cutting you off. It's like, I have a hair appointment. So mm -hmm. I got to get my haircut. Less so can be more. <laughs> one of the things that. Um, you talked about that we, Alice and I talk about in what makes great principle. And I so appreciate you shared this 
is like a lot of times the vision that is implemented is the vision of one, not the vision of the group. Mm -hmm. So like, what's a way that you kind of help? Like, I, I don't want to, I don't want to sound like manipulating here, but there's mm -hmm. also some guiding through the process too. Right. Cause it's like, if ever, if you bring a team together and like, yeah, we should go back to like, just really hammering kids and being mean and old school, like, cause we all turn out fine. I'm like, I don't know if that's a great vision. Right. So I wouldn't be like, well, the majority said this. So how do you kind of like guide through that process, but also, you know, build something together. Cause I don't think it's like, mm -hmm. you just pull yourself out of your vision. Totally. It's kind of right. building that too. So like, how would you see that process? So if I was coming in to help someone, um, the visible thinking tools and discussion-based protocols, um, I think support that opportunity for people to work together. So I think a certain amount of structure, not too much, yeah. but also not too little, um, creates, opens up that space for creativity. Um, and, and, and allowing the, so let's say I'm coming in and I'm doing this with principal and teachers or whatever it may be, your district leaders, et cetera. Um, that, well, you know, creating the a common tool that the North star of the division or of the school that's already yeah. there. So it's not just like you said, you're kind of pulling it out of the sky. Mm -hmm. You have having that North star, but also what does that really look like? Sound like, feel like, I know that was referenced um, in the book, the, the clarity of the vision is where that co-construction can come about because what, no matter what division I'm going to, and I'm doing a lot with strategic planning or alignment planning, or whatever, a lot of us want the same thing <laughs> for our students and for our kids. Um, but what does that really look like, sound like, and feel like maybe different over here than there? Um, so providing, I'll use a back to the future protocol, um, and then maybe some affinity mapping to really allow and um, take the different ideas and find the common denominators, knowing that that North Star kind of guided. Because a lot of times um, that North Star is pretty general. And so it gives you that guidance there, but it's in that clarity of the vision. So I'll see um, where people are like, oh, we've got this vision, but it's not clear. You still right. can't describe what is it, because what I see might be different than what you see. It's like when we were speaking earlier, what do you think teaching mean compared to what, what I think? So right. really even unpacking the, the nuances um, and creating that clarity. Um, I believe is how supporting the the co-construction of the vision um, and or you can start from something that's a little bit more put together and say, let's pull it apart and put it back together. I actually worked with the division to include a superintendent um, out in Arizona where they had the, these goals and we they we needed to kind of do a new because um, they're trying going to try to do a new strategic plan and the language too, even what is a goal, what is an all of that was a little bit um, nuanced and people had different understandings. So we had to break it apart and get to kind of that common language um, and then put, they had some great, amazing things already there, but we needed to take it apart and put it back together. So in taking it apart and put it back together, that that's where that co-reconstruction, I guess, was of high value in the process. So as a facilitative leader, the process and the conversations that happened as you move through and to work toward that outcome are just as important as the outcome um, and the teams that can form and those relationships and the um, just the different strengths of, of a group can be leveraged. The, the When you're talking about this, uh, I, I wrote about this a while ago because it was like, there's like, hey, these like kind of fluffy visions. And the reason I say mm -hmm. they're fluffy in the sense that it's like, it all sounds good, but what, is it, what does it look like if you right. actually were to achieve it? So what does that actually look like in the classroom? Like, give me something, mm -hmm. something like, this is what we're aiming for. This is what it looks like in a classroom. And, and now are we actually living it? Or is it just a really good PR thing that we're sharing with the community? Like I always challenge this with profile of a graduate. You see this in schools popping up all over the place. And it's like, okay, what are you doing to actually support that? Is it, is it you just throw it out and say profile of a graduate, all of our kids will mm -hmm. do this. What are you doing to actually support that process? What does that look like in a classroom? And do I have some say in that? Or is it just like, hey, you teachers should do this, but we're not gonna actually change anything we're doing at the leadership level, right? So right. I think that, that's a really important conversation. Tammy, I, I'm sorry, I gotta cut this short. But like, I know that you're going to, you and I are going to stay connected after this. I love your stuff, the, the, the way you're thinking about stuff. I appreciate all you did to prep for this. Cause I don't like, <laughs> I like actually tell people don't prep for these podcasts. Cause I don't, so I feel a little guilty, but I didn't tell you to prep for it. I said, there's no prep time. So thanks for, for showing up here. Thanks for being here today. 
I hope people connect with you after this. You can see all of Tammy's uh, social, all the places you can connect with her down below. Thanks so much for watching, Tammy. Thank you so much for your time. I hope you have a wonderful day. You do the same. Thank you. All right. Take care, everybody. Bye-bye.